next speaker is Dorothy Mayernack, and her title is Bethany Ministry Caring for the Sick, Homebound, and Grieving in the Parish Family. Dorothy is a registered nurse, and she's a member of St. Gregory of Nazianzus Parish in Upper St. Clair, Pittsburgh, PA. She earned a diploma in nursing from Mercy Hospital School of Nursing in Pittsburgh, a bachelor's degree in nursing from the University of Pittsburgh, and a master's in nursing education from Duquesne University. She has over 40 years of varied experience as a nurse, working in hospital bedside nursing, outpatient specialty units, nursing education, hospice, and community health settings. She retired from Pittsburgh Mercy Health System as a manager of their parish nurse and health ministry program, which assists RNs nationwide of all denominations who volunteer in their churches. Dorothy got her own start in parish nursing 20, 22 years ago at St. Gregory's at the request of her pastor, Father Bruno Astori of Blessed Memory. Father Bruno saw a great need to reach out to the sick in the parish, and at the time, Dorothy was involved in a pilot program for ministry to the sick and homebound, and she worked with Father Bruno to get Bethany ministry started at St. Gregory's. Dorothy continues as the coordinator with 11 dedicated members, now under the guidance of their pastor, Father Valerian Miklik. Dorothy wrote a handbook to help parishes start a Bethany ministry and prepare lay persons to reach out to the sick and homebound parishioners. She is going on to share with us how serving in Bethany ministry is a way of living our faith, which is, of course, the title of this assembly. Dorothy? There's Dorothy. Oh, there you are. Okay, very good. Well, I have to tell you, it is really a big privilege for me to be here to speak to you, because never in my life had I planned to end up where I ended up in nursing and now and in the church also, which is it's just a beautiful combination for me. Um, I grew up as a cradle Byzantine Catholic, lived next door to my Baba and Grandpa, and it was, it was wonderful. At 18 years old, I went off to nursing school to be taught and really form, go through formation uh, to become a registered nurse um, under the guidance of the Sisters of Mercy in Pittsburgh. Yeah, and the Sisters of Mercy brought the first hospital, Mercy Hospital, in the country. You know, they're very brave sisters that, you know, I dearly love them all in their history. Um, so, when I was making all, you know, how you're supposed to, when you get your evaluation, then you have to make a five year, where do you see yourself in five years? And I've been doing that through my career, which lasted yeah. a good 50 years, give or take a few sabbaticals I took to have my children. But when I was making my goals for my careers in nursing, I somehow never really thought of picturing myself getting into parish nursing. I had no idea what it was. Um, in fact, um, somehow it found me, really. It was just my, my destiny to, to land into parish nursing. If anybody has, has anyone ever heard of parish nursing or faith community nursing? Okay, one person, that's good. The young person, love it. Um, parish nursing is, um, it's a specialty. It's, it's a nursing specialty. It was founded by Reverend Dr. Granger Westberg. He was a Lutheran minister in the Chicago area. And it was in about 1986, and he was doing some um, substitute work with, uh, in, a, in a hospital. He was taken over for one of the chaplains. And he became very, very interested in holistic health, and he became an observer of how nurses interact in the healthcare system, seeing them as the connection between faith and health. He saw nurses with one foot in 
to sciences and one foot in religion, you know, to bridge that gap. And since he was thinking holistic health, he thought these were the perfect uh, profession to, that he could prove the, the value of having nurses in the church. So I kind of got into that uh, long story. I won't tell you how, it's gonna take me forever, but that's how I kind of ended up in there, and which led me to, um, to this topic that I want to speak to you about, Bethany Ministry. I know there are a few people here that I know uh, that, that have heard about it, but maybe, maybe, probably not the majority. So let me get started with that. Bethany Ministry, I think, I know, it's an absolutely beautiful ministry. And it's all about living our faith. So let me tell you about it and my experience in working with my wonderful fellow parishioners on this ministry. And I'm going to focus on three key words, what, why, and how. So um, her, what is Bethany ministry? Why is a Bethany ministry valuable in the church? And how we build a Bethany ministry at St. Gregory Church, and I've kept it going for 23 years. What is Bethany ministry? It's a ministry of caring. It's made up of lay persons in the church. We all understand what the word caring means and applies. We see someone who is having some sort of difficulty. We care about them. We want to help them. This is caring. Pittsburgh Mercy Health System hits it a little bit harder when they put these signs in the great rooms and the conference rooms that say, you know, post these up on the bulletin board. You see it, you own it, you fix it. <laughs> That's the directive that goes out. And, you know, once you see something, you got to do something, right? So that's kind of where, where I'm coming from in my background. Now many churches have an outreach ministry of caring made up of lay persons. And um, for, you might be familiar with Ladies of Charity in the Roman Catholic Church. And then there's in the Protestant churches mostly that I see Stephen ministry in them. And that's a very um, popular one. Now, when I Googled, I, uh, I just Googled homebound ministry, sick ministry, that kind of thing. I got loads of a list of uh, churches that have a ministry that they simply call homebound ministry or sick and homebound ministry, pastoral care ministry. You know, that, those are the kind of generic titles. Um, Back in 1997, 98, around there, uh, there were several of us gathered into a committee and we were brainstorming to come up with a ministry of caring for our Byzantine Catholic Church because we didn't have ladies of charity. We didn't have anything specific like that. We wanted to try to start that because we thought it was important to, to, to care for our parishioners. Someone in our committee came up with the idea with the name Bethany Ministry was suggested. And for creating a new ministry, this name, I thought, was absolutely perfect. The committee wanted our ministry to be rooted in spirituality, rooted in scripture, guided by scripture. So naming it Bethany Ministry gave us a rich source of Holy Scripture to use to write up our spirituality, our philosophy, and our goals, which every program that you write up has to have those components. So 
So we identified what I call, I was called, I was first calling them pillars, and I thought, no, that doesn't sound right. Let's call them guiding lights, because they are shining light on what we're supposed to be doing. And I came up with four of them. Um, number one, of course, is the great commandment to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, yeah. and love your neighbor as yourself. So basically, love your neighbor became the cornerstone of building Bethany Ministry. The other three guiding lights that we identified will give us the how-to direction. How do we love our neighbor? What do we do that shows that we love our neighbor? I didn't even turn that on, that's exactly what I wanted. <laughs> okay. What is guiding us? What are we learning from this icon? For our purposes, we see the icon depicts the friendship of Jesus, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha from the town of Bethany. Therefore, that's where our name comes from. Jesus loved his friends. He loved Mary more than Lazarus. He visited them and he spent a lot of time with them. So therefore, we should also spend time with our friends who are hurting or sick. The homebound, those grieving the loss of a loved one. We need to take from that example that we want to spend time like Jesus did with his friends. We see Lazarus. Well, we're all going to be kind of like Lazarus sooner or later, maybe now, uh, prone to sickness, right? <laughs> and uh, at that time, when that time comes that we are prone to sickness and going through something, we need, um, we're going to reach out to people. People are going to have to help us. Um, Lazarus died, and scripture tells us that Jesus wept. He was sad. And for our purposes in Bethany ministry, we take that as we must reach out to the grieving. Grief lasts a long time for people and they need other people. Mary, she's our role model there too. Uh, very important. Mary sat at Jesus' feet and listened to his words. From her, we're going to take that part of Mary. We need to sit with our friends and listen to them with our full attention. You could call it holy listening. I feel that this is the gift of the heart, the gift of the heart, and it really helps a person to feel better. In my own practice, especially out, well, no matter where I was working with, uh, with patients, whether it was in the hospital or the community, a lot of times people, you know, they just, they see you, they see your friendly face, and Maybe they're just like ready to, they just have a lot on their minds, a lot on their minds. And they'll talk and talk and I'll listen and listen. And at the end of the time, I mean, I can't do anything to change their situation. I really cannot do one thing. But it never fails that at the end of the, they're telling me these things, they would say, Thanks for letting me cry on your shoulder. I feel a lot better. And, uh, you know, that's heard that in various uh, word combinations through my career. Listening, as Mary did, to listen to Jesus, uh, you can't, uh, that's probably the most important thing we can give to people, our full attention and we show them that we care. And caring is very powerful. Okay, Martha. Martha kept busy with the tasks of hospitality. Now, scripture tells us 
that Mary chose the better part. Indeed, Mary did. But we will take from Martha's example that we should, we should try to be helpful when we see that our friend needs help. Just a little quote from James chapter 2, verse 14 to 17, Faith and Works. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister has nothing to wear and has no food for the day, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, but you do not give them the necessities of the body. What good is it? So also a faith of itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So faith and works. We also are going with, with the works. Um, theme here. We have the works of mercy, right? And I had them on this um, one of the handouts thanks to the GC for printing them. Um, so these are, the, and on the other side about the gospel story of the sheep and the goats. It all goes together. So we know that the things that we're going to do to reach out to those in our parishes who are sick, uh, sick, homebound, and grieving are right there all in the works of mercy. So to recap, Bethany Ministry is guided by Love Thy Neighbor, follow the role models of Jesus, Mary, Martha, reach out to anybody who is a Lazarus, Faith and works go hand in hand and practice the works of mercy. So this is the, the basis, this is the foundation of Bethany ministry. Okay, the next part is the why part. Okay, why is the Bethany ministry valuable in the parish? One of the missions of the church is healing. And I want to focus on how lay persons are needed and can definitely contribute to the healing mission of the church. Okay, the church is and has always been a place of healing. And this is, um, this is comes from the philosophy of um, parish nursing, really, um, where I first heard this. It's like in everything you read about parish nursing. We know, we know way back in the history of Christianity about healing of the church, that it was the nuns and the monks that cared for the sick. The care of the sick became a hallmark of Christianity. I was reading an article recently that told about St. Basil the Great and what he created in the fourth century. He created a huge facility that included a poorhouse, a soup kitchen, a trade school, a hostel for travelers, care for the elderly, a hospice for the dying, and a hospital for healing, which gained the reputation of the first hospital. It was nothing like it had ever been seen before. So the church has that long tradition of caring for people in need and of healing. Okay, healing, what's all that about? Uh, one of the very first things that we were taught in nursing school by the sisters is that we need to provide holistic care for our patients. A person is made up of body, mind, and spirit. Our soul, body, mind, and spirit. We are three parts integrated into an inseparable whole. You cannot separate the three when you're taking care of a patient. You gotta take care of the whole person. Health and well-being depend on harmony 
in the body, the mind, and the spirit. And if something's wrong with the body, it's going to affect the mind, and it's going to affect the spirit. So we learn in nursing what to look for. You know, nursing, for, for example, the, di the definition of nursing is the diagnosis and treatment of human response to a health problem. Okay, so if you have, doesn't depend on, you break your leg, or you, you know, you're in a cast, you probably can't eat very well because you're upset and maybe the medications and the pain medicine. You're worried, you know, you, you can't work. You're worried about who's gonna take care of your family, you've got your mind. Your spirit can be affected. Some people can say, God is punishing me. This is why I fell and broke my leg. You know, it's, you can, um, just an example of how things are holistic and, and we you know, can't just take care of a person's broken leg or fractured arm. We have to think, you know, how, how's everything else going for you? Now, here in our church, of course, we have sacraments of healing and they are holistic. Uh, we have reconciliation and confession. God created everyone with a conscience and whenever we do something that is a burden on our conscience or our mind, we have the sacrament of confession for healing our mind. Holy Communion the prayer before Holy Communion. May the partaking of your holy mysteries, O Lord, be not for my judgment or condemnation, but for the healing of my soul and body. And further down, make me worthy to receive for the remission of all my sins. Which part of us allows us to feel worthy? That would be our mind. Very totally holistic. Um, our church has divine services that include anointing with holy oil for healing of the soul and body. For example, during Holy Week on Holy Wednesday, typically, or if the, our Father God will have a um, malevolent, sometimes he does them for can people with cancer, and then he'll have a healing service with anointing. Well, guess what? I think I was pressing the wrong button anymore. <laughs> oh, well, I think you got it now. Okay, so there are those three sacraments of healing, but sometimes you have to go on the road, right? And the priest needs to go to the person in their home to give the sacrament of the sex. Um, now, when the, when the priest administers the sacraments to people, that really is number one in, in importance in healing. We're going to start there. Um, but second, we lay persons can be healers too. We really can. And I like to use the definition of healing that, that we use in parish nursing, faith community nursing. Um, the healing is not the same as curing. For us, healing is to relieve unnecessary suffering. Okay. Healing means to relieve unnecessary suffering. There is an epidemic of loneliness and isolation. This on the left is the U.S. Surgeon General's advisory, it came out in 2023. And he is, it's all about loneliness. He took a, he took a walking tour, you know, to talk to people and ask them about their problems. And he was shocked to learn how many people told him they were lonely, that they feel like they have to shoulder life's burdens on their own, and that they feel like if they drop dead right now, nobody would notice. And 
the Surgeon General noted that making human connections are very powerful. And what our Surgeon General suggests we do is, and I copied this right off of the HH Health and Human Services website, that he suggests we all phone a friend, make time to, to share a meal, listen to a person without distraction, perform an act of service, a work of mercy. This is exactly what we strive to do in Bethany ministry. And I think it's what, what we would expect, you know, if we're done and not more sick, who would you think would come and visit you or reach out to you? You would think maybe somebody from your church when we're talking about love thy neighbor. Um, So we're doing that. Uh, the American Medical Association calls it a public health crisis, the epidemic of loneliness. I see it. I see it, and, I can, and we, we all see it, and we can all treat it. We don't need to be, have too many credentials after our name, just the one that says, you know, that little heart on your sleeve, or wherever you want to wear it. I want to mention about uh, Duke University, the Center for Spirituality, Theology, and Health. Uh, Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, they have a rep reputation for state-of-the-art medical research. And they have a Center for Spirituality, Theology, and Health. It's under the direction of Dr. Harold Koenig, very well known. And he's the lead author of the book, Handbook of Religion and Health. The third edition uh, came out this year, 2023. They have their, they have, they hold five day workshops on spirituality and health research. They do experiments <laughs> and they'll, they'll take groups of people that and ask certain groups to pray for these cardiac patients, but the other group they don't pray for. I mean, it's kind of, uh, they come up with some, they want to find, find the link as much as science can. Some of this stuff, you just have to believe and know it's, know it's there. But, but they're very into uh, the spirituality, theology, and health, and all I have to say, Duke University School of Medicine knows that the church is a place of healing. A lot of doctors do. Um, there are a couple clinics in the Pittsburgh area where the doctor and the nurse will pray with you. Usually, it doesn't happen when you're seeing your doctor because they're on such a tight schedule, but you can, there are uh, Christian health centers that you can get that kind of care if you, you, if you seek that out. We started Bethany Ministry at St. Gregory's 23 years ago because it came to our attention that there were needs and there was suffering in the parish and nobody was responding. Um, I think our parish was typical back then, back in 2000, we were a new, uh, small, we went from a mission parish to one that had a, like an actual building or a basement for a while, and then until we got the church built. But anyway, um, we had a lot of bills back then, fundraising was a real priority. And back then we were mostly young, middle-aged people with a few older people. Um, unfortunately, one of our young moms with three young children uh, under school, not even going to school yet, maybe kindergarten and on down, she was diagnosed with cancer. She had major surgery. She was going through uh, chemotherapy, losing her hair, and the whole bit. Um, I think we all were aware of what was going on, 
and that she was going through a terrible time in her life. But nobody was really doing, nobody was doing anything. We did not have an organized response in place to help our parishioner. Well, it turns out that this young mom's neighbors and friends had organized people in their own churches to take the family a home-cooked meal every day, to help out with the children, to do some things so that their, the husband could go to work and, and keep, you know, he was the breadwinner, keep that much stability. So, um, and that's basically the reason one day Father Bruno <laughs> looked at me and said, Dorothy, come here. I need to talk to you. Um, he just said, you've been doing this Bethany ministry. We were doing some pilot programs at that time, trying to get this all uh, figured out and polished up. And he said, we need to start this ministry here, right away. Next weekend, I want you to prepare a little five-minute talk after the gospel. You can have the floor. You can explain what you want to do, that we're going to start this ministry, and we're going to get it started. Okay. So I did, at that time, a small parish, but we still had three divine liturgies, Saturday, Sunday at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. So I showed up and I gave my little talk and informed the congregation, not, not mentioning why we were going to, that someone had inspired us by the, you know, this young mom that was sick. But um, just informed them, this is what we want to do. We want to create a ministry that we're going to reach out to People in our congregation were sick, homebound, elderly, and those who were grieving. So I informed the congregation. I put, put a sign-up sheet. And, you know, in my talk, I said, you know, if this is something you think you'd like to be involved in, I sign this sheet in the vestibule. And we're going to schedule a meeting and talk about it a little bit more, give you some more information. We had 21 people sign up. And we're not a very big church then, so that was a good percentage. A week later, we had a meeting, and it was basically a brainstorming session about what needs we saw in our parishioners, what we could do what resources we had to work with. So it was kind of a general discussion, just trying to get up as many ideas as we could. Now somebody took notes so that we'd have a record of what we talked about. Now anybody that wants to volunteer, let's say if you want to volunteer in your local hospital or with a hospice agency or Ladies of Charity or Stephen Ministry or whatever, you do have to go through oh, that junk. Um, pardon me. Um, you do have to go through some sort of a training or an orientation so that you'll know how to do the job. So um, during our our pilot program, I looked at a lot of training materials because I knew we, we needed to write one basically because we needed the theology of the Bethany ministry story in there. So these, there's a number of them available. There's way more than that. And um, in fact, that Stephen ministry training manual comes in two volumes. It's about this thick and requires 50 hours of training. And I knew that wasn't going to be anything that we could work with us. So uh, all that to say, I thought we should have, we should have our own specific training manual, uh, a little handbook that would include the spiritual, spirituality of Bethany ministry and the spiritual care specific to our Byzantine Catholic tradition. Mm -hmm. 
I had to decide how much detail to put into this training. I didn't want the two volumes, but I wanted enough to get people up and running. And I know I was working with a lot of adults that had life experience and probably didn't need, you know, probably could be sent off to do ministry without, without too much prep. But I was at a, a church function, and this was, you know, like 20, I'm talking the year 1999, and I was talking with this young 20-year-old uh, girl, and we were talking, we got on the subject of ministry, and I said, well, you know, we're working on this Bethany ministry and trying to figure out how to, with the framework and how to get it off the ground. And um, she was very interested. She told me that she had been, recently started volunteering for the Pittsburgh AIDS Task Force. Back, back that many years ago, AIDS was really, you know, high visibility uh, illness and, and a great stigma attached to it. But this girl, she just felt a lot of compassion for uh, people with AIDS and she volunteered for their buddy program. Now then she told me that she was assigned to a buddy that had been admitted to the hospital so she went to the hospital to meet him and visit him. And she said, this is what she said to me. She said, well, I went to the hospital. I found the room. I went in. I introduced myself. And then I had no idea what to do next. So I went down to the gift shop and I bought him a milkshake. <laughs> So that told me, you go ahead, put a lot of basic information into this handbook that people could read and kind of, uh, you know, prepare better for having this visit or phone visit or one-to-one -one during after church, you know, things to go about communication techniques. I always think. I heard this one when I was taking a thing in communication. The speaker said, and what is the opposite of listening? No, what is the opposite of talking? Yeah, what is the opposite of talking? Okay, what is the opposite of talking? Listening. And the answer that came up was waiting to talk. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and you know what, I, I do that sometimes too, you know, well, sometimes, you know, but no, for our purposes, we need to listen. <laughs> we need to listen fully and give someone our full attention. That's how people know that you really care about them, and that's how you connect with them. Other things we had to uh, bring in. With a big thing about confidentiality. I kind of buried it in the middle, not buried it, but I stuck it in the middle of the, of the book. And, and because I think, I, think, I think you need to get rolling first before you, you know, start on that. But, With confidentiality, we have to, um, people have to understand that when you're visiting somebody and they may tell you a lot of different things, you know, once they get going, and a lot of personal things that you might find out about them, and a lot of things that they don't like, or people that, you know, that they're estranged from, you find out all kinds of things. But those kind of things, need to be kept confidential. We are not to be talking about our parishioners that we have visited. If anybody, um, if anybody would ask us about how's Mr. or Mrs. so-and-so doing, 
you know, you say something like, you know, they're doing pretty good, um, or I, I don't know, I haven't talked to them, whatever, but you don't really go into any details. So that was, um, you know, a main thing that we had to <coughs> instill in, in this handbook. And I got some good, and I, to put together the handbook, I collected a lot of really good information from uh, different workshops that I had gone to, and, and I asked permission from the presenter, could I use these? And I was, you know, got, got all that permission and written and even writing. And it was uh, Catholic Charities when I went to uh, Sister Maureen Lafayette, of course, on uh, care of the breed. You know, grieving, a, a, a grief ministry, and she she had made out a confidenti confidentiality contract, and you would read it, and then you would sign it, and, and you know that's that always makes it more real when you have to sign something. They have to turn it in. I didn't keep it, but you know that was the the idea on that. So all these other things, um, how to be a good listener, how to weave some prayer into your visit, practice that, talking about the sacraments so that they would know. Um, now understanding mental illness, there's a little bit in there, because sometimes you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. Um, trying to make spiritual care part of the visit. What about visiting those with communication difficulties? People today visit their relatives that have Alzheimer's and they say, well, they don't even know I'm here. And uh, you know, why should I even go visit? Because it's not worth it and all that. But it definitely is. And there are ways to visit uh, somebody like that and make it a meaningful visit. So there, there's a lot of good information that we put together. So our, at our first meeting, I put, um, I brought up the idea of two training sessions that it would involve all this kind of practical information and, and really even equally important <coughs> was that it would be a team building, uh, you know, kind of a bonding. We're on the team now, we're, we're gonna go out and, and visit our sick in our home about our grieving. We need to build that bond between all of us. So I explained it with, that we were gonna do two and a half hours on care of the sick and homebound, and then a, a, another two and a half hours on care of grieving. And, and with grief, there was a lot of little things like um, grieving adults, grieving children, grieving teenagers, um, you know, there's a lot to it. Uh, and it, it does take time to get through that information. So once I explained this, you know, I'm asking for five hours of your time, everybody was in. Everybody was wonderful people, just love them. So I scheduled the two training sessions um, to, for the following weeks. Um, well, right after Divine Liturgy, we would get a cup of coffee and then we'd get set up and, and do our training. I borrowed an overhead projector from work. One of those, a lot of people in this room probably never saw one. <laughs> You're not missing anything, I'll tell you. The, this big contraption, and you have to do, do your slides on these um, with magic markers on a transparency. Well, you know, it was the best technology we had back then. So we did the we did the training, and after uh, after maybe a couple of months or so, then Father Bruno did a commissioning service after at the end of the Divine Liturgy, and and. and it, in this way, Father was informing the congregation that he was sending us off to begin this ministry 
to the sick homebound and grieving, and they would know who we were. Immediately, we started having meetings every third Sunday of the month. Meetings are very important, especially in the beginning. We learn about each other's experiences, expertise, ideas. We find out about health problems that they had or their family members have gone through. And this is a really big asset to a Bethany ministry to have people who have survived serious illness and they're here looking very healthy here today. Um, somebody else mentioned Henry Nowen this morning, I, but I'm gonna mention Henry Nowen again. Um, his book, The Wounded Healer. Wounded healers are people whose painful experiences enable them to help others because they've been there. They got through it. So at St. Gregory's we have some amazing wounded healers that we match up to our parishioners uh, when they're going through some different health problems. We've come, we always came away from our meetings with a good feeling about working together with wonderful people. We'd see them in church and say hi and you know, prior to being in this group together, we would just be saying, hi, how are you? You know, that social conversation. But we really didn't know anything about them. Or, you know, what interesting people and capable people they were. That, that's pretty much why I love joining committees and being with groups, you know, being in a group of people because uh, you just, share so much and you know a lot of things it's very it's, I just think it's great I don't know how else to put it so in serving with Bethany ministry I think we had to figure out what to do um, how we're going to start this what exactly are we going to do so we decided you know first number one we're going to pray we're going to pray daily for the health and healing needs of our parish family i heard of one of our um, priests at mercy hospital that gave us a little talk reminded us that a ministry begins in prayer it flows through prayer and it ends in prayer so pray daily so so that was our number one we were going to send get all cards and sympathy cards from the ministry and include a card with all of our names in it because I, I took on the task of sending out the cards and I would write you notes know, and love and prayers from Bethany Ministry. And I thought, when you get this card, people might wonder who are these people that are praying for me. So I made, you know, on the computer, made this little card and and the phone put it in, included it with the get well card. Same thing with one of us then after a while would follow up and call the person and with a phone call to see how they're doing. And do they have everything they need? Is there anything we can help with? And 99 times out of 100, they didn't need any help. They had family, they had friends, they were fine. Every once in a while we find somebody that we really need to do a little chore for. The next thing we thought, well, since we're gonna be sending out get well cards and uh, calling people on the phone, we, we need a parish directory. We did not have a parish directory at that time. So that was, became our first uh, task. And then we, we diagrammed out a phone chain because this was before cell phones. <laughs> How did we do it before cell phones and the internet? So we diagrammed out a phone chain so that so and so you would call and, and go through the whole church and then find out. We figured we're a small parish. We call ourselves a parish family. If somebody in the family dies, everyone should know, right? Um, I remember one, um, before we started this Bethany ministry, there was a, a very fine lady helper, did a lot of work for the church, 
went to 9 a.m. liturgy, and I went to 11 with my family, my, our three young kids. Well, she passed away, and it, it was like, because I didn't go to that liturgy every, at all, I didn't find out for like two months that she had passed away. So, you know, we decided we're going to call everybody out. So that's what we did. And we still do that today, only it's, uh, we, we send emails and uh, a father's out will put it on the Facebook page so that communication has come, become a lot easier in these days. Now for the death of a parishioner or someone in their family, we would attend the funeral home for the Panahita. Then whoever was not working and was able to attend the funeral, we would go so that there would be a representative. Now there were times when there were hardly any family, and I can remember a family, the father passed away, he had one daughter. She came up from out of state. She was there at the funeral home. The two neighbors that lived on either side of, of the gentleman that died, and um, father and the cancer, and three of us from Bethany Ministry. So it really, it really was important. It really is important if somebody goes to your church. Some parishioners have to make an attempt to go to the go to the funeral to, to be part of that. So that was our commitment. And I don't know, people don't like to go to funerals these days. So um, or they're busy and was working, they can't. So we do keep that up. Um, following up with the funeral, we decided we would make a condolence call. You know, a few weeks later, we're going to call you, say, can I come over? Can me and Barb come over? We, you know, we have, we have a little something for you from the church, and we take a plant over is what we started to do, and just, just visit with them. Um, because we cared about them, reaching out to them. Later on, you know, we would take people, maybe arrange to take them out to coffee or lunch or something like that. But just make that follow-up contact. And then remember onward, you know, at church, how are you doing? Because, you know, grief takes a long time for them to get over. They, mean, they might get over it. A lot of good things came out of the ministry. And just in talking, um, at one meeting we talked about that our church had three gentlemen that had passed away in the, in the course of maybe six or eight months with these three deaths. And um, noting that we now had six widows in our church. And somebody suggested why don't we get these widows all together for lunch? And um, so somebody said, okay, I'll make up the reservations and call them and you know, drive home. We had that all arranged and got them together for lunch. It didn't take long before the Widows Club was born. That's what they wanted to call themselves, the Widows Club. No sugarcoating it. <laughs> The Widows Club soon began arranging their own monthly luncheons and formed their own support group. I noticed one time at a funeral visitation that the man whose wife had died, um, one of our widows was talking to, to him, the spouse, and she said, Joe, you're gonna have to go out to lunch with us now. And Joe said, I'm not a widow. <laughs> and the widow said, that's okay. You come to lunch with us. They were taking care of their own. Now something unexpected came out of this group because these women, these widows, happened to be among the founders of our church in the 1970s. And they had saved many photographs and newspaper clippings from the early days of the church. So uh, after a while, 
they decided they were going to make a scrapbook with all the materials that they had collected in these boxes in their houses. And voila, the Widow's Club turned into St. Gregory's Historical Society. <laughs> and they did a first class job. We have two beautiful, big, about that thick, um, scrapbooks in the back of, of the church on the narthex. In fact, one of the uh, people from our Bethany ministry arranged to get a friend that was a carpenter to build these um, stands so that they could sell them like lamps and everything. You know, it's it, it, really, really nice. And we've kept, we have, since they did that, then we had to get a committee to keep doing that so that we have the, the whole history of, of St. Gregory's. But, I guess the Bethany ministry came up with an idea to reach out to the widows and offer support, and it took off in a direction that we could not have predicted. And in the last 10 years, this group has further evolved into this single seniors club for men and women, and they meet monthly for lunch at a nice restaurant in our area. Um, in, the, in the early days of the ministry, we had another idea to put a, a book on a stand in the vestibule. Just, you know, one of those cloth covered, really nice books where you're supposed to write your diary or some report from the notes or whatever. And we put it back on a stand, like a lectern that we had, the church, extra one. And a little sign that said, please pray for, and we put a pen there. And we were wondering is it, if anybody's going to write in this book their prayer request. And really, it did not take much time at all before people started writing down uh, their requests for their prayers for their family members and friends who were struggling with some sort of illness. Another project that came out of our meetings was a prayer shawl ministry. I had heard about it from one of my uh, parish nurse colleagues when I was, I was working at Mercy at the time. And it's like you get knitters together, they make these prayer shawls, and while you're knitting or crocheting, you should be praying, and you're praying for, some, you don't know who you're praying for, but you're praying for whoever's going to receive this prayer shawl. So we got a lot of knitters. Um, got some, created some beautiful shawls and some lap robes, like small afghans for the gentleman. Father blessed them uh, after liturgy one day. And it was a very beautiful and comforting gift, knit with love and prayer. We we'll put a little card with it. And people appreciated it when you took it to them um, when you visited. We got to be very in tune with, with the, and familiar with the sick, the homebound, and the grieving in the parish. And we couldn't have predicted how that knowledge would have become so important. But it did. Uh, sadly, our pastor, Father Bruno, died suddenly and unexpectedly in 2009. We were all in a state of shock, but we were able to give our homebound prisoners we were able to go to them and tell them the sad news in person. Then when the new priest arrived, uh, we passed on the information about the sick calls. And there was very little interruption in pastoral care. A few years later, we got another new priest. And he was there for a couple of years. And then we got another new priest, which happened to be Father Valerian. So with three changes of priests, the outreach to the homebound was affected very little. And you know, that's, that I think is great value for having a Bethany ministry. Along the lines of helping our priest, sometimes we hear that a parishioner is in the hospital and the family didn't call the priest for whatever reason. They didn't think about it. They don't feel comfortable with it. I don't know. 
but bottom line is they don't call. Um, now we, that's when the Bethany ministry member becomes the liaison between the parishioner and the priest. Some people want to keep totally private. I get that. I respect it. But if they happen to tell me that what's going on in their family and somebody's very sick and they don't want anybody to know about it, but they told me anyway, um, I always suggest to them, you know, we really need to bring Father Val into this. Trust me, it'll be a help to your mom, your dad, your husband, your wife, whatever the case may be. It will be a real help for, the, for them to have Father visit them and, and to administer the sacraments. Is it okay if I let Father know and so far, no one has ever refused that offer. Sometimes people need help calling the priest. And that's, that becomes a way that we can facilitate that. Now let me fast forward to 2023, where we are, fast forward. Um, we have um, 12 of us. I don't know how many are there, two, four, six, seven, and one that's taking the picture, so that's eight. Which is a pretty good, uh, you know, 75% of the people are there. So these are meetings that Father Val will schedule a meeting four times a year. He always schedules one the month before Christmas so that we can plan our Christmas gift bags and visits. And the same thing with Easter a meeting for, for us to plan that Easter visits, and in July to plan for August because we can take one of the blessed orchids that he blessed with the door mission of Our Lady um, and we take it to our homebound. And, uh, and uh, usually a meeting in the fall to come up with some sort of a work of mercy project where we sponsor a collection of items needed by a community agency that serves the poor. Our last one was for a food bank in, um, run by the Sisters of Mercy, actually, in McKeesport, which is a pretty depressed area. And I called and I said, what kind of things would you want us to donate? And um, the coordinator said, our food bank really needs cereal. <laughs> Boxes of cereal. So yeah, bring cereal. I said, what? What about like any kind you want, like healthy or you know low sugar? No, bring bring any kind. You know, sugar cook, good cereal. They enjoy it. She said a lot of our elderly eat cereal for dinner. So um, we collected over 100 boxes of cereal plus other things that was on her list and, and, and took them over there. So that was one of the works of Mercy Project, our most recent one. Now with Christmas and Easter being a very busy time for all of us, you know, making those visits when you're trying to decorate your Christmas tree and help with the church cookie sale and buy presents you're going to get a turkey because you're in charge of you know, Christmas dinner and all that. You know, it really, you really got to squeeze it in there to, that, to get, carve out that block of time. And I, usually it's like, you know, maybe it could be like a four hour block of time before the, by the time you get in your car and uh, travel and get that and all that. So, um, we only have, we have to make the time to visit, and it's, but it is doable. We usually have six to eight uh, homebound at one time. One time we had 14, that was very unusual. We had to recruit some people from the, uh, some of our parishioners, and they were glad to do it. That's the thing, when you ask people, when you have a leader and a team and a committee, you know, that you figured this all out, and you just need a little help, People who are very good at accepting like a task 
and to carry out and help you. Now, if you have a church that's really big, and maybe um, like my friend Amy's church has 30 homebound, so it's a very big um, Greek Orthodox church. So they have more people to help, and, and they kind of scale down what they, what they take to, to their parishioners, but they still get it done. Um, another thing we do is we mail the church bulletin to our homebound parishioners every week. And we do visit the nursing homes, uh, mainly taking these uh, Christmas gifts and things. And I have to say that the visits to the nursing homes are, they can be difficult for people that aren't used to that environment. Uh, so two of us go together. Uh, I'm pretty used to that, you know, the sights and the sounds and all that that you experience when you walk into a nursing home. So it doesn't bother me, but um, it works better when two of us go together. And the parishioner always is so appreciative that somebody came to see them. A lot of times there's a family member sitting in the room, you know, one sitting in the chair, one's in the bed, nobody's saying anything, it's a long afternoon. And when we, two of us walk in, the mood actually seems to lift, you know. Well, just like when we get company at home and we're happy to see them, the mood lifts. Father Val, he told us he calls these visits bringing the light of Christ. I thought that was a very, very beautiful thing, a uh, picture for us, him to give us for our minds. And in St. Gregory's we become more in tune with the needs of our parishioners. We see more people coming to church with canes and walkers. I, a long time ago when I was 20 years old at the church, I remember that. I don't know if people didn't, they just struggled without them or what, but now we, now we have a lot of people with canes and walkers and they're driving their cars, but they have a little trouble, you know, parking. So um, we started offering valet parking so that they could pull their car up to the right, to the front, stop there. One of the, we started with Bethany Ministry going out and uh, getting their car, you know, you know and, and parking it down in the parking lot at the, down below. Now our uh, ushers are taking over that. They have taken that over. Now, over, um, over the years, I myself and some of our members in the Bethany ministry have, have given people a ride to church. And a ride to church, or doctor's appointments, or to the hospital, they have to have some sort of a appointment for a diagnostic test, and they're going to get a sedation, and they won't be allowed to drive. Really, um, I've done that. It's not a long-term commitment. I don't mind doing it if somebody's in my area. That's, you know, we can only do it whenever it's reasonably in our area. We can't do everything for everybody, but we try. Okay. In giving rides to people, you know, I think about my, my mom. When she needed to ride to church, because her, her um, knee was getting bad, and people would give her a ride to church. I couldn't help her because I was 30 miles away. So now it's kind of time, okay, I can, it's payback time. I can, um, I can help someone else. There's some of our outreach. Okay, with these gifts, I just want one little comment that I heard. We accept a nice little bag and we make it look pretty. And I remember taking it to some one of the ladies, and, and they always enjoyed pulling out the little gifts. And, and this one lady was especially um, enjoying everything that she pulled out of the bag. And, and she said, 
I can't remember the last time anybody gave me a present. So, you know, then you feel like you really did something nice for somebody. So, we want our parishioners to, at St. Gregory's to know that their family prays for them, cares about them. We know it's therapeutic, it helps to relieve loneliness and therefore relieve unnecessary suffering. Um, it's rewarding to us. Sometimes we, we talk about our visits and sometimes we get more out of it than, than they do, actually. Uh, I, can't, yeah, I can't really tell too many stories because of confidentiality, but, but, but trust me, it is very, very rewarding. It's all good stuff. I absolutely love it. If you feel like um, you feel that calling, you want to start and, and think about starting a Bethany ministry, we at St. Gregory's would be very happy to help you in any way we can. I have, I brought some of the books here, the handbook, and I'm going to put them out, and you can help yourself have a freebie if you'd like to have it. And on on this. Uh, I think I put Father Bell, our contact information for Father Bell and myself if you want to give us a call. Um, I want to thank you for your kind attention this afternoon. I have a feeling that you're all doing good works for your families and your friends and your churches. And I just want to close by wishing you many blessings for all that you are doing to love your neighbor.